and then we will start. Okay, dokes. Well, good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, February 22nd. Um, this is Manhattan Community Board 7, Public Safety Committee. Uh, my name is William Ortiz. I am one of the co-chairs of the Public Safety Committee with my fellow co-chair. Please introduce herself as well. Polly Spain. Thank you, Polly. Uh, in attendance, we also have uh, Max, who is uh, the district manager of CB7, uh, Beverly, who is the chair of CB7 as well. And we're great, very lucky to have, uh, all, I believe, all of our members of, of the Public Safety Committee, as well as special guest Andrew Albert dropping by today and getting us our special guest speaker for this evening. So a big thank you. Big shout out to Andrew for helping oh. arrange and set up this meeting as well. You'll love hearing from, from these people. They're wonderful. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. On the agenda, we have a quite a long list of items, but I feel like a lot of them might be chat. Part of the conversations might move interchangeably as we start discussing Public safety and uh, some man. Please mute, Richard. Thank you. Um, so we're going to start with our special guest speaker, Transit Police Chief Michael Kepner. Kemper. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, Michael, are you here? Where did you go? I'm here. I, I could hear you. There you are. Awesome. Right. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, as you can tell, the CB7, of course, all of Manhattan in New York City is very <clears throat> uh, concerned for public safety. And uh, we would love to hear what you have to say as far as what's been going on in the MTA. What are some changes that's been happening? Um, what the progress have looked like? What are some challenges? Um, but please, the floor is yours. So I'll start. I, I, I have a, a few minute skit. Uh, when I'm done, uh, feel free. If anyone has any questions, I'm on the line and I have some people with me also. But first off, good evening to all. And thank you for having me as part of this meeting tonight. Um, talking about the big macha, Andrew Albert, who uh, a, a couple of weeks ago asked me if I would be interested in attending this meeting and I jumped on it. Andrew is a uh, board member on the MTA. Uh, he's someone who I recently met, but he's certainly someone who I'm uh, learning to respect uh, and consider him a friend. So thank you for inviting me, Andrew. Thank you so much. You're joining me with uh, from my team, from the NYPD is Inspector uh, Stephen Hill. He's the commanding officer of all transit operations in Manhattan. When I say transit, the police and the subway system. <clears throat> also with us is Captain Amanjeet Sandhu. He's the commanding officer of uh, District Number One, which is in Manhattan. And also with us is Captain Salvatore uh, Marchese, who's the commanding officer of District Three, also in Manhattan. So a little about who I am and about me. I'm Chief Michael Kemper. I'm a 31-year veteran of the NYPD. April will be 32 years complete. I'm currently the chief of transit. Uh, to put that in simplistic terms, I'm the person responsible for all NYPD operations in the New York City subway system. I answer the chief Madry. Uh, he's the chief of department. And of course, the police commissioner, uh, police commissioner Sewell. I started this role uh, the first week of December. So just about three months ago. And I'm coming from Brooklyn. I was the commanding officer of Patrol Borough Brooklyn South prior to this assignment. So I'm just about three months into this role and my life has been nonstop uh, since in the last three months. Uh, but to say I've learned a lot and experienced a lot and met a lot of people is uh, an understatement in these short three months. Just a quick understanding in case anyone doesn't know uh, about the Transit Bureau. So the men and women assigned to the Transit Bureau patrol the subway system in four of our five boroughs, with Staten Island being in the only borough that the NYPD Transit Bureau doesn't patrol. 
the MTA police uh, patrols in Staten Island. There's a total of 12 transit districts in New York City. The transit district, you can look at it like it's a police precinct. Uh, a transit district, police precinct, uh, synonymous. Uh, the only exception is a transit district uh, is underground or above ground. They patrol the subway system where a precinct patrols uh, the streets. Uh, the 12 districts are staffed by cops, just like a precinct is. They're commanded by either a captain or a deputy inspector, again, just like a precinct is. And the cops that work out of these districts primarily work in uniform, uh, with some of them also uh, working in plain clothes. And obviously, it's a 24 7 operation in the uh, transit system with uh, the Transit Bureau. Um, each district, just like a precinct, has identified geographic responsibility. And if you're curious why I have two districts, uh, commanders with me tonight on this call is because when I'm looking at the uh, community board, uh, District 1 and District 3 uh, it, it comprise, both districts can, uh, have a piece of the community board. So let's talk about crime in the subway system, topical subject and understandably so. Millions of people a day depend on the system, the subway system for so many reasons. Um, it's literally the lifeblood of our city, and it really is what keeps our city moving. I'll start by saying this. We are very encouraged at the progress we've been making in relation to crime in the subway system in recent weeks and months. And I'll explain why in a second. But please, as I move forward, don't misinterpret anything I'm saying. We are not claiming victory. Uh, we recognize the challenges that lie ahead of us. We recognize we have a lot of work to do, but I'll end that with, we're up to the challenge. And the men and women of the NYPD uh, realize that and they're working their butts off. But like I mentioned, there's some very encouraging data, some real progress that has been achieved over the last four months and, and, and progress that we wanna continue with in relation to subway crime. Okay, so let's talk about calendar year 2022, a very difficult and challenging year for us uh, in the transit system when it came to crime. <clears throat> From January 1st, and forgive me, I've been talking all day. From January 1st to mid-October, so the first 10 months of 2022, overall crime in the subway system was up a very concerning 41.6% in crime. A dramatic, dramatic uh, increase in crime for the first 10 months in 2022. Granted, we recognize we were comparing from the prior year, the year before that, two years largely affected, particularly in the subway system by uh, pandemic related complexities. But that 41% increase for the first 10 months was extremely high and un unacceptable and concerning to so many. <clears throat> Just about everyone realized this and, and people became scared uh, to use the subway system and understandably so. So it was in October that Mayor Adams and Governor Hochul launched the COPS, Cameras, and Care program. Simply put, that program was an investment in subway safety, a tremendous investment. Because of that program, it allowed the NYPD to infuse, if you will, an additional 1,200 COPS a day into the transit system, assigning them to train patrols, platform patrols, mezzanines, and turnstiles. It was also at this time that the conductors started announcing the presence of cops that are on a train or on the platforms. And if you use the subway system, you'll understand, you understand clearly what I'm talking about. The results of this investment were swift and significant. Uh, and because of the long hours of the cops really working long hours, hard work, um, crime, crime began to sharply decline at the end of October and it continues to decline up until this very minute. To offer you some data, again, crime was up 41.6% the first 10 months of 2022. So starting on October 25th with the mayor and governor's program and up until today, so we're talking about the most recent four month period, 1025 to today, crime is down just under 11% uh, versus the same four month period last year. So we went up from being up 41% the first 10 months, investing in the police officers in the subway system, and now we're down 11% the four months that followed. We, um, 
Most notably in these stats, there's a 26.2% reduction in robberies in the subway system in these most recent four months. And when we compare this most recent four month period to the same four month period of prior years, we're currently at the second lowest overall crime level in the CompStat area, era. What do I mean by the CompStat era? That's when we started recording uh, crime stats in the subway system, like pre-merge, like in the mid nineties. Um, so we're going well over, well over two decades. Only 2020, the height of the COVID pandemic, we uh, recorded a lower four month period that started on October 25th, the same period I'm talking about now. When looking at the current year that we're in, 2023, we're just completed about seven weeks of the year. So, and when we combine January and February of this year, overall major crime in the subway system is down 19.8% versus last year. Overall crime is down in all four of the boroughs that I just spoke about that we patrol. Crime is down in all index categories, including a 25.3% reduction in grand larcenies and a 21.3% reduction in robberies. Again, if we compare year to date, the first seven weeks of 2023, so 1-1 through today, February, what is it, 22nd? Again, it's the second lowest uh, start of the year. Um, second lowest in recorded history, second only to what year? Again, um, the pandemic year. Again, I could sit here and we could talk about data and I could sit here and say we're down 19.8% in crime. But if people still don't feel safe riding in the subway system, what does it all mean? What does it mean to someone that just doesn't feel safe riding in the subway system? Some of that we got to chalk up to perception. They, they, they're watching the news, and, and if, if we take four crimes a day in the subway system, three of the four are on the news, uh, perception is, is jaded, and some of it is reality. A lot of it is reality, what they see, and we realize that. And that's why I say we have a lot of work to do. There's a serious homeless um, issue affecting the subway system. Connected to the homeless um, is mental health. And those are two very, very big challenges uh, that we're facing right now in our subway, in our subway system and, and policing it and making it safe and really making uh, people uh, feel safe. The good news is uh, when it comes to that, those topics, mental health and homeless, uh, we do have plans that are uh, in place, that are in progress. Uh, the NYPD is working with our partners from City Hall, uh, whether it's DHS, um, homeless outreach, uh, uh, mental health professionals. We work together jointly each and every day. Uh, and that's really, uh, I mean, I can go on and on. I'm, I'm, I'm here to answer questions, but I just want to end it. That's, you know, as I mentioned, the data is encouraging. I think it's very important that the community hears this data, that crime is down this year versus last year. And when you're looking at overall crime, um, together, we're, we're at historic lows. That's, that, that's, that's real. Those are real numbers. That's real data. We're at historic lows in, in the uh, subway system in relation to crime, uh, not factoring in the COVID year when the subway system was literally closed down for periods of time. Ridership was very low. The ridership's increasing right now in the subway system, which is, uh, which is awesome. The MTA does pulse surveys. Uh, to their riders and, and their customers. The survey results are very positive also. The most recent December and January results are very positive in relation to uh, the riders' feelings about safety in the subway system. They, they, the the uh, percentages are going up and they're also happy with the number of police officers that they see in the subway system, which is another positive trend that we wanna continue with. Um, I'll end it with that. If anyone has any questions, concerns. I'm here to answer questions. I had the borough commander uh, from Manhattan uh, on with us, and I got the two district commanders that represent uh, your community. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Kepner. I did have a question. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you so much for the data. Uh, I think it's really important for everyone to hear what's been happening to the city and how things have improved. Um, I have a question in regards to subway in the transit system. Uh, 
for me, I remember when I would take the train pre-COVID. I feel like it's just another world talking about it like that. But taking the train at night, never did I have to ever have to question whether I needed to be vigilant. I would take the train at 9, 10, 2 a.m. And I, I, I did, it would be an afterthought of putting my, like not having my phone out, not having my AirPods out, and just knowing I will get to my destination safely. When you say crime is down, is there a specific time when that's happening? Is Are people more vulnerable in the train stations now past a certain time than they used to be way back when? Um, what does that look like? How does that feel? I know a lot of us, I can speak for myself that, again, taking the train at night is a little bit of a, a scarier situation. I just have to be a little bit more vigilant. And it just, it just never was like that before. Um, if that is true, if my feelings are true, how soon would it, how soon do you think we'll get back to that point of pre-COVID of feeling safe riding the train at 2 a.m.? So you brought up a couple of great points. And um, that is our goal. Our goal is certainly first and foremost, reduce crime. With a comma in that sentence, and create an environment where people feel safe, right? And it kind of goes to what I said before with, I could sit here and spew all this data out, but what does it mean to people that don't feel safe? I recognize that. Um, as far as um, crime times of the day, <clears throat> we track that daily, like almost by the minute live really. And, and, and really that's, that's how we deploy our assets, our resources, our cops which is critically important, us being aware of what times the crimes are happening and where they're happening. Um, it might not surprise some people. I'll give you some high, uh, high periods uh, of, of crime when we throughout the day. Um, it's, the highest period of crime is usually from about 3 p.m. to about 6 p.m. And that coincides with the p.m. rush and the school dismissals. A lot going on in the subway system. Um, Interestingly enough, you know, when you look at, and I'm going to pass it off to Steve and his district commanders to answer, um, you know, just drilling down into the Upper West Side in Manhattan, because they'll have that answer in two seconds. I'm going to talk system wide. System wide, um, as, as a whole, the average, the crime is lower on that first platoon, or I shouldn't say first platoon, you don't know what I'm talking about, overnight hours. Crime is actually lower on the overnight uh, night hours, but there's so much less ridership, which might equate to just not having that same feeling that when you're walking around with hundreds of people at the same time, it offers you a sense of like almost like a security blanket, all the people around you versus walking through a uh, subway station. Some of these subway stations, I don't have to tell, uh, tell you, uh, are dark. There's narrow alleys you have to walk to get from uh, point A to point B in the same station. Um, you just don't feel safe. You know, you, you just don't feel safe. Uh, and maybe not for cause, uh, just because you don't. But Steve, uh, I don't know who on your team could speak specifically for uh, the Upper West Side in relation to uh, crime during the overnight hours. Hey, and, how you doing, Steve? And, 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 each borough, hang out, and, and each borough is different also. Listen, Manhattan's Manhattan. You know, Manhattan's rocking. I was out Saturday night in the uh, uh, the transit system. I was so happy with what I saw. It was packed. And I'm talking about midnight, one o'clock in the morning. People were out and about in the subway system, which is great to see. But I, I'd probably venture to say if I was somewhere else in the city in a different borough, it would be a ghost town at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, Steve, go ahead. Hey, Chief, thanks, thanks for having me on. And, 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 uh, and thank you, Community Board 7, for holding this forum. Um, I think this is great. Uh, I want to just, uh, you know, piggyback off the Chief and saying that with, with, with uh, the new strategies that he's employed with cops at the turnstiles and extra presence, we're getting precinct help coming down into the stations. I'm going to talk basically about Community Board 7 zone. OK, so and, 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 and District 1 and District 3 share a piece of that zone with stations. And, you know, just to give you a, a narrowing down of what the chief said, he spoke system wide about crime. 
when we look at Community Board 7 subway stations, District 1 and District 3, from January 23rd to February 19th, we took four crimes versus 12 crimes last year. That was a 66.7% reduction. And out of those four crimes, three were closed to arrest. Now we'd rather have zero crime, but just to show you that the deployment that we put out there under the direction of the chief with our turnstile uh, deployment, and we also have the precinct cops that do four hour post tour overtime on those platforms in district one and three in those stations, the police presence alone, I believe is working. Cop, people wanna see a uniform cop when they come into the train system. And that's what they've been seeing. And you know who else sees those cops? The bad guys that wanna come and do something. And I believe, and I've been a transit cop almost, uh, uh, I've been on the job almost as long as the chief. I have 31 years, he's got one on me. When these people see a cop in a uniform standing at that turnstile, they're turning around and they're going someplace else. So, you know, this strategy is working. Uh, this, this zone that we have with these two stations here, you're going to see a cop, I would say, almost all the time when you come inside the transit system. Uh, we're talking about 5-9 Columbus Circle to 8-6 Central Park West. That's District 1. And then we hop into District 3. That's 110 and Broadway up to 9-6 in CPW. Okay. Very tight zone. Uh, you have four-hour post tour with precinct cops on almost every station except one. That's 103 in Central Park West. And like I said, I can even go to year to date in that zone. From January 1st to February 19th, 11 versus 15, a 26% reduction. So I'm not claiming victory either, Chief, but I do believe that we're going in the right direction. And we also need to just keep the pedal on the metal. We're gonna keep this deployment. We want people to be comfortable. It's the perception. It's like the Chief said. You get one or two incidents in the subway, it's all over the news and everybody's uh, they're not looking at statistics and things that we're talking about. So we're going to keep this posture up. We're going to keep the uniform presence in the subway. And, uh, you know, you know, we're going in the right direction. And hopefully the rest of the year we can uh, bring crime down in transit even lower to lower levels. Thank you so much, Stephen Hill, for that response. And thank you so much, Chief Kepner. Uh, Polly, you have your hand up. You have a question? Yeah, first of all, I want to say thank you uh, definitely to the chief and to Stephen and also to um, excuse me, uh, Captain Salvatore for the work that you're doing in the subway. And I am a person that rides the subway every day to go to work. Uh, I particularly take the A train or the C train, which for me, you know, uh, everything that you mentioned, et cetera, I've seen some improvement uh, since last year when the mayor first announced this new initiative. Um, so I can say that it is working, what you are doing. Um, I had some other questions, because what I've noticed, maybe the chief, you could answer this, this is a system-wide question. I've noticed that there's a lot of um, bikes uh, with lithium batteries on the subway. And also I see a lot of passengers with dogs. Um, so can you speak to that? Cause I get concerned in a crowded car when I see all these bikes, you know, we're stuck in the tunnel. So I don't know, you know, if it, if it might start a fire or whatever, what is the policy on that? And then also, can you speak to the code of conduct? Uh, cause I wanted to know basically like, uh, certain, I would say issues like panhandling, uh, you know, how is it treated? Um, if you do, um, get someone like the follow-up or they like refer to some agency because I read the um, code of conduct. And so I just wanted to know, you know, what is your policy as far as enforcing certain rules on the subway? But could you speak to the bikes with the lithium batteries? Is that going to, you know, change how things are done? Because I would like to know if either the MTA, if you guys have sat down and had a conversation about that, how that's going to be treated and then also about a lot of dogs that are not seeing eye dogs that are in the subway as well. Steve, you want to jump on that? Just as far as the dogs, um, and, and you know what? You're right. I, even the bikes, the, the bikes. They, first of all, they shouldn't be riding the bikes uh, once they're they're in the station. 
So that, that's right off the bat. No one should be riding a bike uh, into the station. The, 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 uh, the seeing eye dogs, it, it's been expanded with uh, other types of dogs also, comfort dogs. Um, so, Steve, you want to jump on that? If, if you could try to answer every question she had one by one. Um, Absolutely, Chief. So, you know, I'll start with the dogs. Uh, you know, as okay. you know, there are therapy dogs. There are CNI dogs, uh, you know, and according to the MTA uh, rules and regs, uh, they, they have to have a, a certain color code on their on the collar on the leash. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't remember. I think the the, the, the red button. collar is the CNI dog, and the therapy therapy <laughs> dog might be orange. Uh, so you know, the police officers are instructed on that, and you know, obviously. We catch people who have no authority to have the dogs, and if they don't claim that it's a therapy dog or a CNI dog, we do an injection. You know, but that's very rare and far and in between. Most of the time, it's a therapy dog, and and I do believe now the rule is even if someone says it's a therapy dog, we got to tread careful waters because there's no color code for a therapy dog. This is just something that's it's even in airports, mm -hmm. so we be very careful with that. But if the dog obviously is vicious. And there's uh, attacking people. Police will take action. As far as panhandling, that's a no-no. Uh, we try to we try to enforce panhandling vigorously. And I'm not saying that we're trying to lock people up who are down on their luck or anything like that. No, but, yeah. Uh, in my experience, and I've been a transit cop for almost 18 years. Uh, a lot of the times, the panhandlers they turn into robbers or grand larceny specialists. If they're not getting a dollar or two from somebody, they'll snatch what they take. So I've instructed all my officers. Uh, to eject panhandlers, especially if they're aggressively panhandling, uh, you know, and so that's enforcement that we can do, and it's also in the New York City rules and regs, as for the transit rules, that uh, there is no panhandling that's uh, allowed in the subway system. Now, for the bicycles, obviously, no one is allowed to ride anything: skateboards, skates, bicycles. It just creates a hazard on the platforms, and there is a New York City rules and reg about large, bulky items on the subway. So if we have somebody with a lithium bike on there, or uh, I've even thrown people out with scooters, believe it or not. I've stopped people mm -hmm. trying to get on the elevator at Grand Central with a scooter. Outrageous as it may sound, this is what's happening. My officers have been instructed to eject those people immediately. And, uh, you know, the large bulky item rule in New York City rules and regs, that's a tool in our toolbox that we can use to write a summons and or reject someone that has a, a bicycles on the uh, on the subway subway system. Yeah, because I just, as I said, I ride the A train, and I've just seen the proliferation of bikes, dogs, you know, everything. So that's why I wanted to find out, you know, what is the policy regarding that, and what can be done to address it, because you know we're in a crowded train. It's rush hour. And, you know, we're on top of each other. And then, you know, we have to kind of navigate around and hope that, you know, the battery doesn't blow up. But I just feel that's a safety issue. So that's why I wanted to know how would that be addressed? And yeah. with the dogs, I understand about therapy dogs, but these are not therapy dogs, to be honest with you. Um, I guess they have them down there for protection or whatever, but it's a bit much when you have, you know, bikes and dogs and, you know, everything else in a crowded space. And then with the panhandling, unfortunately, I, I feel like I'm being intimidated and I have to give money in order to ride the train, you know. And for me, it's uncomfortable because especially the A and the C train on Friday, forget about it. It's like one after the other. And I have seen um, other passengers be terrorized if they don't give money. So I just feel that if that's something that could be looked at, you know, it would be greatly appreciated. But to me, like I said, that line is the worst. And in the morning when I go to work, you know, it's like it's a hotel, uh, especially at 59th Street, because I know that they are basically removed at the yard. But somehow, between the yard and 59th Street, they take up all the cars in the morning, and then it's like, you know, it, it's very uncomfortable. So, I just that, wanted to know. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. District okay. 1. Amaj, you on? Captain Sandu, you on? 
right. I don't, I don't know if he not, got cut off. I don't know. It's if not he so he good news. Off. No, it's, it's um. But I know uh, Inspector Hill will pass that along to uh, Captain Sandu. I know Captain Casey, you're on, right, Sal? Uh, yes, I am, sir. And they hear okay. they're hearing what you're saying. Uh, they they should be taking notes on what you're saying, and they should really be following up on what you what you're saying. If uh, Captain Sandu got disconnected for some reason, uh, your concern and your complaint will be passed along to him also. Uh, that I can assure you, and that's why meetings like this are good. Forums like this are good. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear from you. you. Tell us where the problems are, what your concerns are. And then it's our job to hear you out and follow up on it and help correct it. So, you know, that that's definitely what will be going on from here. Now, what would you say? Which line you said? The A line? The A and the C line are the worst. And you said 59th Street in particular? Yeah, 59th Street. And when the train pulls in, especially between 7 a.m., like rush hour, it's a hotel. Every car has at least two or three people sleeping. And you know it's it's unbelievable, <laughs> um, and you know, yes. That's and just then, like I said. Um, also, you know, I do. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. That I'm glad you brought this to my attention, and 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 just to let you know, and I'm sure you already know, mm -hmm. five nine Columbus. There's a there's a transit district right there. There's a police station right there. Okay. And that that station is manned. 24 hours with two police officers on all three shifts, okay? And I will mm -hmm. definitely bring that to the commander's attention. And I'm just looking at some of the numbers for the 28-day uh, period from January 23rd mm -hmm. to February 19th. At that particular station, we've had 16 arrests, over 446 mm -hmm. tab summonses written. We've had 91 train inspections done there. So we'll increase that, and I will bring that specific narrowing down of the homeless outstretch, the panhandling, and the bicycles mm -hmm. to their attention. And I kind of can see where some of those lithium bicycles are, because we got a lot of these messengers and these delivery men that get on the train and go to their job. So, but but still, like you said, they shouldn't have to be sharing that bicycle with a crowded rush hour train. And we do have enforcement tools that we can use to eject those people with those bicycles. They got a bicycle, ride the train to work. I mean, ride the street, ride it on the street. Why are we riding down on the train? Exactly. I fully agree with you. Exactly. Right. And we're going to take care yeah, of that. They come on, okay, because they come on at 34th Street, 42nd Street, you know, so I'm saying the same thing you said. If they have a bike, why are they on? <laughs> Thank you so much for your feedback. No, no problem. There will be a directive on that immediately. And, uh, and hopefully okay. the next time we have this meeting, you'll be able to tell me you've seen improvement. Oh, I will. <laughs> Thank you, Polly. Thank you, Stephen Hill. I believe Natasha is next with her hand up, followed by Courtney. Can me? Yes. So I am a very big supporter of police presence on the subways. I've, I'm a very loyal subway rider. I rode the subway throughout the, the pandemic. I still ride it every day. And very recently, my 12-year-old son has started um, taking the subway by himself. So I'm very invested in this conversation. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to the WhatsApp number that uh, the MTA has. I've often made complaints on that and I've received in immediate responses. On that, it's not an NYPD number, but it's a it's an MTA number and it's a WhatsApp number. In real time, they respond to you um, about issues. But one one question that I do have, or one point of feedback that I do have, is that um, you know it's not so easy to report subway crimes, and maybe better. Um, uh, publicity about that is would be helpful. So for instance, um, you know, a friend of mine recently got robbed, like her wallet was taken on the subway train, but she was like, what should I do? Should I call 911? There must be an easier way. And I'm sure there is like, there is now police presence on the uh, platforms, but it isn't like publicized well enough. Fair evasion, it's still, not only is it still a problem, but it's almost like a business now. Uh, I see a, I've seen twice like a man holding a door open 
uh, one of those emergency doors open so that people can just go in and pay him a dollar or something so that he can make money. And um, also the like reporting of the homeless or the mentally ill, it is not clear at all how we are supposed to report these people. They're not always homeless. I don't know when I see somebody who's mentally ill on the subway, is he mentally ill? Is he homeless? What should I do? And when I've tried to report it to the WhatsApp number, sometimes they say, yeah, we'll, we'll pass it on to our homeless outreach team. But then recently I got a response saying, oh, you know, next time, uh, make a complaint directly to 311. But 311 is not like an emergency service. You know, if you, you, you see somebody uh, who's acting in a mentally deranged manner on a train, calling 311 is not going to help in the moment. So, you know, that kind of communication, like what to do in these specific um, situations, like when you see somebody who's mentally deranged, who looks like he's homeless, needs help, you know, what do you do in those situations? How do you report these situations? And, and I speak actually as somebody who in 2018 was actually physically attacked on a very crowded one train. So, you know, I have like firsthand sort of experience with that. And now that my son is riding alone, I would like more clarity on that. But overall, I'm very supportive of more police presence and thank you for everything that you are doing. Thank you very much. Um... You said a lot, and, and a lot of it uh, hit home. I, I, I'm invested also. Uh, my, my daughter takes the subway uh, every single day uh, uh, to where she works in Manhattan. She used to live in Manhattan. Um, she can't afford Manhattan anymore, so she went to Jersey. But she uh, uh, she's on the uh, subway uh, every day. In regard to how you could report um, any incident, really, um, if it's an emergency, uh, or if it's truly concerning, I, I recommend calling 911. You could report also to any MTA employee. They have access to uh, calling us for you. If your phone doesn't work for whatever reason, you don't have service, but the conductor um, by the booth, uh, you know, the, the uh, MTA employees that are by the booth, if you see a police officer, you could report a crime or an incident that occurred in the subway system at any police precinct in New York City. Doesn't have to be the district. It could be any police precinct. It could be a cop that you see walking on the street in a different borough. Uh, he or she um, will take your report for you and document what uh, what occurred, if anything. And that report will be electronically forwarded uh, to the district or the precinct of occurrence. Um, so there's multiple different ways of, of reporting. Or, or you could call 311 also. Um, but you're right. I mean, if, if it's an emergency or if it's, you know, truly, truly concerning, I would recommend 911. If you see a cop, an MTA employee, uh, or any, uh, any, um, any way like that. In the near future, I know the NYPD is working on electronic reporting of cert certain crimes and incidents. That's not out right now, but in the near future, uh, it will be. I, I know for sure the NYPD is working on that, uh, and it's going to be an app. It'll be app-based, and uh, it'll give you options on what you want to report, uh, whether it's lost property or a low-level crime. As far as seeing the police in the subway system, you know, Inspector Hill and myself said this. We're doing this a long time. Everyone always likes to see a cop. Uh, and here's my three-month takeaway in in in, uh, in transit. And I mean this. Everyone always likes to see a cop. It, it offers them a sense of security, safety. But people love, really love to see the cops in the subway system, on on a train. I could feel it when I'm out there in uniform. I could sense it. Everyone notices. Everyone recognizes. And everyone, in my opinion, truly appreciates it. I've never had anyone come over to me and say, we don't want you in the subway system. Um, if anything, people are thanking us for being there and asking, forget asking, demanding for more, more police. Um, so what you said is not only uh, your feeling, it's our feeling, it's my feeling, my personal feeling. You know, when I step on a train, I see people, they're mindful, they're aware. And Inspector Hill brought up a great point also. The good people, which is the 99.9% .9 of the uh, the ridership, 
and that very small segment of the ridership that is looking for an opportunity. They see us also. Um, and the, the uniform is a great deterrent. Um, and it, it's, it's really our biggest tool to combat the perception. Just having cops presence uh, uh, strategically uh, positioned or assigned on trains, uh, certain mezzanine areas. Uh, the, uh, the issue you brought up with the, uh, the fare evasion is, is not an issue uh, unique to uh, Upper Manhattan. That's a citywide uh, issue. Listen, I'll call it like it is. We cannot be at every um, turnstile in the city 24 hours. We, we just can't. And, and people are opportunists and, and you'd be surprised. Like we'll, we'll be at a certain uh, turnstile. I've, I've seen it, personally seen it where people come in, they see the, the, the cops stand in there, they turn around, they walk out and they either walk to the next station or they go to another turnstile uh, because this is, this is business for them. This is, this is how they, they support themselves. But if you see someone doing that, which is illegal, uh, and it is a business, it's an organized business for some people, um, where they break the, uh, the machines, not allowing people to uh, uh, put money on their cards, and then it forces them to pay them almost a dollar or two bucks uh, to, to, uh, to walk through that gate. If you see something like that, please, that, that is an important, uh, that's important to us. And we wanna correct that immediately. And the first MTA employee you see, whether it's walking through the mez or on the platform, or even when you're getting on a train, um, let that person know. Let that person know and ask them to call the police. And we communicate um, in real time uh, with our partners in the MTA. And an issue like that is concerning not only to the MTA, but to us also. I don't know what else you asked that I didn't answer. I, I, was there something else that you, you brought up? No, um, I think that was it. I think um, definitely more um, communication between the MTA employees who are in the station, like the, the people in the booth, uh, and the NYPD and like I feel like better training for the people in the booth uh, because I've seen people jumping over turnstiles in front of people you know in the booth but I, I'm not sure what they're doing about so it. I testified so. at a city council hearing um, a few weeks back and um, I told them that I'm in full I was in full uniform at a certain station and and, and somebody uh uh, jumped the turnstile right in front of me. And when I stopped, I wasn't even going to write the summons. Uh, I didn't even have a summons on me. Don't tell him. Uh, but I said, hey, you can't do that. And uh, it was almost like uh, shocking to them. Uh, I, I didn't know what to make of it at the time. I, you know, do, do, do these people um, feel it's their right to not pay? And you'd be surprised, like, when it comes to fair evasion, 97% of the people that are stopped for fair evasion are released with a civil summons, not even a criminal court summons, a civil summons. But like our fair evasion enforcement isn't around, is, is not geared toward, it's not about arresting people, incarcerating people. It's about correcting behavior. It's about having rules and correcting behavior. The 3% that aren't released with a civil summons some of them are released with a criminal court summons, and some of them we can't release because they have warrants, right? So they have a warrant for their arrest. And there are people that are jumping turnstiles that have hundreds of dollars on them. It's not a financial issue for, for, for everyone. Granted, and certainly it is a financial issue for many, but you'd be surprised the people that are jumping turnstiles and not paying, fare evading, and walking through open gates, these are people with 50 bucks, $500 on them, $25. These are people with money on them. Um, and for whatever reason, they, they choose to. And um, again, the stories, there's so many stories. We, we had someone that jumped a turnstile uh, in front of the police maybe six weeks ago. Um, and he, he was carrying two guns, two loaded guns on him. Like you think you're carrying a gun on you, nonetheless two, 
Like, wouldn't you want to remain low key? <laughs> you know, what are you looking to bring attention to yourself for? This individual fortunately jumped the turnstile. So you'd be surprised, like our, our turnstile presence and enforcement is very, very important. It's critical. Um, and and, and I, I, I know it. I believe it. And I know it. It's critical uh, to crime and fear in that subway system. Um, I, I'd venture to say almost 100% of the people that rob people or, or commit acts of violence and crime in the subway system are not paying their fare. Absolutely. You know, so that's a whole other topic that uh, that we could talk about for for a long time. But um, any MTA employee, we 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 do work very very well with our partners in in the MTA. That that I I I know, and there is a direct line of communication in real time between any MT the MTA uh, employees and the police, the police department, the NYPD. So just keep that in mind. Be mindful of that. And if God forbid you need some help and you don't see a cop, but you see a train pulling in, let that conductor know immediately you need the police. OK. Thank you. Thank you for that. Chief, I, let, I, me I, just I, add, let me just add in uh, with that, because I know you said you're not sure when to call 311 or 911. And so I'm going to give you an example of what happened today, actually. At 6-6, six, six. Um, we had a, a call. It was a 911 call of an unstable man waving a knife on the train. Yeah. That's a 911 call. And we responded and we arrested that gentleman. Okay? But now if you see a man laying outstretched sleeping on the train or just a homeless person, that's a 311 call. Okay? That's the difference. The difference is what is the danger factor? If you have a homeless person mumbling and shoving people on the platform, I would call 911. But if they're just sleeping, they're partially dressed, and they're just, you could obviously can tell that they're in some kind of emotional distress, but they're not in any posture of harming anyone, that's a 311 call. And I would just say between 911 and 311, you got to weigh in the danger factor, okay? I think you have some more hands up, Will. Yep. Um, following uh, Natasha's Courtney, Andrew, then Doug, then Richard. Great. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to echo all the thanks for all the hard work you all are doing. Those numbers are really impressive and really heartening. Um, I would say two things. I was actually going to ask about the fair evasion piece of this, because I know that we've seen that anecdotally linked to a number of the high profile uh, crimes um, in the subways. And I know that we all, I, I personally also see a lot of the fare evasion linked to some of the problems on the buses as well. So I, I was going to ask you that question. And I just think that's something we should continue to think about um, as a committee as well, um, that we know that that piece exists and what else can we be doing? I also just wanted to mention, and this is mostly for our our, um, our board members here, that there's a piece by Nicole Gelinas, uh the last couple of days on this that I think really speaks to, um, though these numbers the trend is really good, uh, I think that she talks to the fact that the number of violent felonies per ridership is still higher than it was pre-pandemic. So I think this is something where we shouldn't, we as a board, shouldn't be lulled into a sense of complacency here. This is still something we need to be vocally supportive of um, in all of the ways that we can be supportive, advocacy, DNS, budget priorities, all of those ways. So obviously these this trend line is really good. My question therefore is given that um, a big piece of our, our role here as a board has an advocacy piece, um, for, for those of you on this call, what, what should we, what would you suggest we be doing um, to continue to promote safety, to continue to help these numbers go in the right direction? Um, what would be most helpful that we could be doing looking ahead over the coming months? Chief, Chief, I'll take this one. Can I take this one, sir? Yeah. Oh, I'm on, uh, am I on mute? No. Yeah, Steve, yeah, it's all yours. Yeah, so, so, you know, listen, um, there's a lot of things that we can do to, re to reduce becoming victimized on the subway system. I mean, every one of you 
have gotten on a train. And what do you see? Uh, almost half, if not the whole car, buried in their phones with their, their, their electronic devices. And their th now I'm not saying it's against the law to do that, but we have to be vigilant and make sure that we are aware of our surroundings. And every time I get on the train and I direct my officers to get when they get on the train as well, is to just have, try to have a conversation with a few passengers. How you doing? Good morning. By the way, you know, you, you know, you should be careful when you're sitting by the door with your phone out and your headphones on. It might get snatched. Please be careful of your items. Please place your purse in front of you, ma'am. Keep an eye on your belongings. One of the major crimes that we take in, in transit is pickpockets, grand larceny. And we and, and as much as we and it's usually a small group of the same characters that we lock up all the time that are doing this crime, you know, and it's usually because somebody has a knapsack on their back on a crowded train during the morning and evening rush. They go, they get off the train. They realize their wallet is gone. We, we, we implore, and we do have our, um, our community officers out there giving out these, these safety pamphlets. Uh, and the MTA, I believe is doing some public service announcements on watching your belongings and keeping an eye on yourself. And if you see something, say something. Just be a smart passenger. Push your phone away. Is it that important to talk on the phone till you get to your destination? Most of our crime is the cell phone, pickpocket, snatch, those things of that nature. Bags, unattended, people leaving wallets on the train seat, people leaving laptops on the bench while they're waiting for the train. Just if we, if we can get 50% of the people to keep an eye on their belongings, you would be an even more dramatic drop in crime. Yeah, you know? let, me, so, let, me, you know. let me jump Let me jump on that. Such an important topic. Just about 50%, 50% of all crime that occurs in the subway system is larcenies. Exactly what he's talking about. People leaving their property undetended, or, or, or people putting their hand in someone's backpack, they're not paying attention. 50% of all crime in 2022, give or take one percentage point, that's it. I'm not, I'm not way off. Maybe it's 49, maybe it's 51%. Of all total major crime in the New York City subway system is 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 uh, grand larceny. This is an important topic. I'm sorry, it's cutting you off. I had to get that out, Steve. Thank you. No, that was great, Chief. You're headed on the nut. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, Andrew, you're next. Thank you. Um, so this is really very informative. Um, I'm glad that everybody's had a chance to hear the chief and his associates here. Um, there are some things that I would like to point out. Um, if you see an emergency or if you think something is going to happen and you're in a station, you can go to a help point and you will immediately get in contact with an MTA person and they can help you and alert the proper, uh, either the station agent or police officers that are in that vicinity. So help points should not be ignored. You can use them when you see something or you think something's about to happen. Um, there are cameras everywhere and there will soon be cameras in the trains as well. Um, the R211s will be coming with cameras installed. The other uh, types of, of trains are gonna get them uh, installed uh, over the next couple of years. but you really will, there will be nowhere that you cannot be seen. And you, you'll notice the police are capturing people within a day of, of crimes being. That's how great the cameras are and how high the definition is. And they are everywhere. Um, the Fair Evasion Task Force uh, is well aware of the issues. And when, when Andy Byford was here, he and I were talking about the fair arrays that we have, the entries, they are a sieve. They are much too easy to breach. I believe the Fair Evasion Task Force will be recommending a new fair entry system, which hopefully will, will put a, some, something to an end uh, to this crazy fair evasion, because the chief is right. Not everybody who beats the fair is a criminal. Well, they are a criminal in that respect, theft of service, but they're not attacking people. But everybody who was, who was arrested pretty much did not pay their fair. That's almost 100%. And um, something else that's going to help with security is the booth agents are going to be coming out of the booths. They will be wandering the stations. There will be additional eyes on the platforms. They will help you with the new Omni vending machines that are coming. So that's that's really a, a major plus that's coming in terms of security. Um, so 
they will also all have cell phones. They can be in touch with each other or with police. So I think things are moving in the right direction. And I think keeping riding and getting your friends to ride, it's always better than, you know, abandoning this wonderful treasure of a transit system we have to the criminal element. I'll be damned if I'm going to let someone deter me from using, you know, the greatest mass transit system, one of the greatest in the world. And just keep riding and doing the right thing. Let people know what's happening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Doug, you're next. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, great. I just we're having some audio problems. I just want first of all, I just want to uh, echo the sentiment. I am so grateful that we have uh, this high command here. It's a real honor to have you at our our mere CB7. Um, I, yeah. I say that jokingly, but really so happy that you're here and honored. And um, and Chief Kemper, I've seen your testimony at City Council, and I'm really impressed with the things. And I listened really carefully. And I I know I, I at the risk of repeating something here, I find it amazing. I'd like to codify this that that just about all violent criminals are fair beaters. Not all fair beaters are violent criminals. I we understand that. But I guess the question I have is, you know, what exactly happens when a police officer observes a fair beater? I, I'm going to be very sensitive about people's civil rights. I know, uh, you know, obviously, um, just like you said in this call, no one's looking to incarcerate someone for the act of fair beating. But I guess what I what I'm curious about is is when someone is observed jumping the fair, a police officer is present. Um, is it appropriate? Is it legal? Is it proper to find out if this person has a, a weapon? Are they allowed to be searched? I don't know. Are they, um, do you check ID to see if the, this person does not have an active warrant? I mean, I, I heard you mention that you did find weapons and warrants, but I just wondered procedurally if that is appropriate. Personally, I think it is. If you are brazen enough to break the law, let's see if you have a weapon and you are about to commit a violent crime. And wouldn't that be great if we stopped it? So it, it, yeah. it seems to me that, um, it's a great opportunity for an intervention um, to first stop the fair beating, because my understanding is we have a $550 million hole as a result of fair beating in a two plus billion dollar budget. It sounds to me, my math is that 25% of the budget problem is fair beating. I don't know if that, that may be an exaggeration, but you know it's still a very significant part. So uh, with that, my question is, what exactly happens when a police officer observes a fair beater um, what's the right thing to do? What's the fair thing to do? What actually happens? So I'm going to walk you through, and I, I don't want to, I'm not dodging it because every situation is different, right? So let's just talk a straight, someone walks through the gate without paying, um, or someone finagles their way through the uh, turnstile without paying. They'll be stopped. And they'll be told what they did, and they'll be asked for identification. They have to show identification uh, because we have to write a summons, and we have to know who we're writing the summons to. Um, you know, and, and listen, we can stop someone. I, I might shock some people on here, but people lie, um, particularly when they uh, don't want to get a summons. And imagine us stopping someone not asking for ID, and that individual is wanted for a murder. You know, I, I just used an extreme example, but there are people walking around that are wanted for murders and other crimes. So they'll be asked for identification. Uh, a situation just like that with nothing else to it, um, we're not searching. We're not searching that individual. If there's more to it, if the cop's talking to the person, they can clearly see the outline of a gun. Obviously, um, we, we could... Uh, Investigate, <laughs> investigate that outline of a gun. But we don't search people on straight fare evasion. So the answer is no. Uh, we would take their license for their ID. Um, we would uh, query to see if they have any warrants or if they're a, a, a transit recidivist or an offender. What do I mean by that? Um, they've been arrested multiple times in the subway system for, um, for the same offense. And, and then they get... Uh, a title uh, attached to them. You're a transit recidivist or a transit offender. 
All that means is that they wouldn't get a tab summons, they would get a criminal court summons. Uh, worst case, they, they'll get a DAT. You know, uh, they'll be brought to the district and released with a DAT. But like I said before, 97% of the fair evaders that we stop are released with a civil summons. Um, everything comes back clean. And, you know, the technology is so great these days, every cop has the phone, this is all done on the phones. Right on their phone, they check. Mike Kemper, uh, he's clean, thank God. Um, I get my tab summons and I go on my way. That's the usual um, scenario. You'd be surprised uh, we have discretion. So I was out Saturday night and I know Inspector Hill didn't want to hear it. I'm, I'm telling I'm stopping people for fair vision right in front of me. How is this happening, Steve, right? Um, true story. True story, Steve. Yes, yes, it is, he, sir. And I went out there right after you to clean it yes, up. I know. Steve's ears were bleeding. <laughs> Believe me, he was cringing when he saw it. But that's a whole other story. Steve's the man now. Um, and uh, I let a couple of people go. You know, listen, I'm a student. I know it's not a school day. I, I got that. Um, and then I, I just personally felt bad. It was a mother with kids. It was, uh, uh, I don't know if she was an immigrant. I don't know what her story was, but it was a mother walking she slept in one kid with a hand. She had a stroller. And I I, I opened the gate for him. I, I let him in. I just, as a human, I felt bad for her. And I would assume that uh, there are police officers that have that human side in them also that use the discretion um, and let, uh, don't write the summons. Worst case scenario, um, we run the name. They come up, but they have an active warrant. They, they, they would be handcuffed. Now it's an arrest. And subsequent to that arrest, they would be patted down and searched for weapons. And then they would be, uh, be brought to, uh, to the district for processing. I hope I answered your question. You did. You did. And, and, I, and I understand the, the finesse and the, the, the um, sensitivity of it. I, I, I think um, I, Every I appreciate Every situation it. is unique. And, you know, that's why I didn't want to. Sure. Listen, it, it, someone could resemble someone on a wanted flyer. Obviously, our level is going to be raised on that. You know, just the routine run of the mill. It's either discretion, tab summons. They're not being searched. Understood. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doug. Richard, you're next. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chief, uh, several of the people who are on this call, members of the committee, activists in the community, uh, frequent riders of the transit system have asked questions about what to do if X or what to do if Y, what to do with a homeless person, what to do uh, with a fare beater, what should a citizen do if they see something uh, that they want to report. And it, it occurs to me, I know that uh, when I ride the, uh, the, the C train um, or the B, uh, is, is there are cops at uh, 59th Street. But that's the only um, communication that I can think of that we get from your office as to what to do if X. And it just occurs to me that, you know, if, if, if for a, a short period, uh, the, the police would uh, prepare a handout hand it to riders, Love telling it. them what their rights are, when to call 911, when to call 311, uh, tell, uh, you know, the, notifying people it's that so every uh, employee of the TA has uh, direct access to the police, things of that nature that are not generally known because people don't think of it. And, and, and people on this call have, have had to ask about it. So uh, I, you know, my my suggestion, <laughs> and I, I make it humbly, is that there be a little bit more formal education of the ridership about these issues. But as you're talking, great points. Um, you, you know, we outreach, educate. You know, it's different. Also, uh, you know, it's unfortunate in this topic. Um, I'd love to be out there more representing the transit bureau with my transit district commanders. Um, the precincts are, are out all the time, understandably so. 
Um, I'll be very honest with you. Um, in three months, this is my first, I'm gonna call this community meeting, community board meeting. Um, I've met with certain communities, but not, not a community board. Um, I think this is great for so many reasons. Um, I, 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 Andrew, I, I can't thank him enough. I think I think you're right. We can do better in our outreach, and we need to do better in our outreach. And part of that is um, attending meetings such as this. We have we have a, a very good social media platform. Shameless plug, NYPD Transit. Um, it's it's amazing. It's the greatest uh, social media platform uh, out there. Um, all seriousness, Twitter. Um, NYP, what is the address? NYPD uh, Chief of Transit or NYPD Transit Bureau, and we're on uh, uh, we're on Instagram also. But our following on 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 the social media in this day and age that we're in is is tremendous. It, it's such a following, uh, and, and so many unique visitors see it. It's another avenue, another platform that we can get or educate the community. Um, we'll do something like that. And I'll talk to the district commanders in, in relation to literature that they could hand out to the riders as they're entering the uh, the stations, maybe at the turnstiles. We could hit peak ridership, AM, PM rushes. I also like the idea, I was talking today, I saw a sign, and I'm learning, and, and, and I'm just being very honest with you. I'm learning every day. I saw like a lost and, uh, lost and found, I saw a lost and, lost and found sign in a station. I thought that was interesting. And I'm not sure how many people, you know, routine ridership realizes that if you lose something, it could be, there's a lost and found. Um, what if you do find something? What do you do with, with property if you find something? Right. Right. So that's just another topic. And it's interesting we're talking about this because just this afternoon I was talking to uh, somebody. I said, let's get a video out um, with, with the lost and founds. Like, I, I want to learn about that. It kind of goes with what, what, what you brought up with, uh, with other education. but. Um, I agree with you. There's so much that our, our counterparts are doing in patrol in relation to these topics. <clears throat> so it, it's not difficult for us to steal from them and, uh, and just incorporate that into the subway system. And uh, I appreciate that. And I agree with you. And uh, we, we're going to get cracking on that. I, 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 I assure you on that. Just crime prevention, all, all of that good stuff. Very, very important. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Richard. Natasha and then Madge. Natasha, is your hand still up from last time? Yeah, it looks as if her hand's okay. up from last time. Yep. Okay, Madge, go right ahead. Uh, could you just announce those things in the subway station or put them up on all those lighted signs? You already have with the transit system on them rather than passing out paper which is going to become trash is there a, a nice simple way it can be done without paper we, yeah we we could do it electronically yes. um yeah i mean we, we could uh awesome and, and i hear i hear your point and it's a great point they're going to take it and they're just going to throw it on the floor yeah, yeah. um well, thank you so much, Chief Michael uh, Kepner. Oh, Natasha, there you go, please. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't unmute in time earlier. I just um, wanted to thank everybody, all, everybody from NYPD from being here. This was very helpful. But I also want to plug for the community board and anybody who's attending the MTA's WhatsApp number. I, you know, it's it's been very helpful to me and to others like, I told a friend about uh, about it once and she called me to say that there was a very disruptive man. And when she reported it on the WhatsApp number, two stops later, these NYPD cops actually entered her, her car. So you can actually, so I guess there is a lot of uh, communication uh, between active communication between the MTA and the NYPD. You just have to know how to report it in real time. And this is a very good resource. This one time there was a terrible, awful mess on the platform on 110th Street. And I reported that I sent, I took a photo and I reported that on the number. And two hours later, they sent me a photo back of the exact same 
spot that had been freshly cleaned. So I would really highly advocate for that that number to be used as a resource by the public because the clearly a lot of coordination uh, um, been by PDN. Just, on this topic, I'm, I'm, I'm exploring the uh, feasibility of communicating through social media, through the Twitter app. Uh, we're not there yet. It's conversations I had. So what do I mean by that? I, I mean someone going to the NYPD Transit Twitter site and DMing or, or messaging. The issue with that would be it probably will not be monitored live 24-7. So we just got to work out some kinks, but it, 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 the beauty of it would it would fit into so much of what's being discussed. Quality of life concerns, just historic issues at this station. Great opportunity. Um, there's something going on over here right now. It doesn't rise to the level of emergency. A couple of things we can get with that is uh, we can learn and we would respond back to the person who sent that message. A, letting them know that we received your message. And then B, if we could get them a response back with the results. So this is something that other businesses do. Um, I just don't know, and, and, and I'm having these conversations and I have to go through legal also to figure out how, how could we get that system um, in place in the Transit Bureau? But th this is all good, good, legitimate topics and concerns that you, you have and concerns that we're talking about. So we're, we're really aligned with, you know, in the same, the same thoughts, so, which, is, which is good. I'll say this also. I want to get us out there in the Transit Bureau. I don't know if anyone else sits on any boards, committees, uh, block associations. Angel has access to me personally. Each and every one of you should have access to your transit district commander as your precinct commander. Uh, if you want us to come to an event or if you want us to come to a meeting uh, to talk about subway safety or anything subway uh, crime related, um, we're here for you. Uh, not only are we here for you, um, with, uh, with pleasure. As you can see, I talk a lot. I have no problem coming to meetings. I'll bring my team. This is what we do. And um, we really, really got to be working together. And, and I always say also, and I mean it with sincerity, um, don't assume we know everything that's going on in every station. Because, you know, we might support, we like to make you think we do. Uh, but a lot of times we don't. And we really need that whisper in the ear. And we really need the, uh, the nudging. What do you say? A squeaky wheel uh, gets the oil, right? I mean, and and it's the truth with everything in life, and and policing is no different. So, um, we, we we are available. Not only are we available, we want to go out. We want to go to community meetings. We want to interact with the community. So, Thank please you so invite us. Thank you so much. Um, I think I want to respect your time and everyone else's time on the board. Um, so, I'm going to go, Linda Bev. Doug, and then Polly with the final word. Thank you. And, and, and echoing everyone here, we are so thrilled that you're here, Chief Kemper and, 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 and Captain Hill and everyone. Thank you for, for joining us tonight. Thank you for coming to us and informing us so well. Um, while Natasha was speaking, I just had this light bulb moment. And, um, I'm, and, and it occurred to me, in addition to WhatsApp, in, in, in addition to the WhatsApp, which is a wonderful app, uh, we have Waze on our car. That's when we, we want to, for directional. And every time there's an incident, whoever is seeing it says there's a direction. There's a, a, a man likely. We could do this. We could do similar software, similar AI to Waze on the subway. And that's really more uh, for Andrew to talk about with MTA. There's a way of dealing of developing a software because it's developed, but uh, um, writing it so that it would work uh, for riders on, um, on uh, the MTA, on the subway system. So that was it. That was just an idea. Do you yeah. have, maybe use the ways uh, on, uh, for directionals on, with your car? Mm -hmm. The same idea. Yeah. We can, we'll, we'll talk about that. It's an idea. Yeah. 
Thank you, Linda. Beverly, you are next. Um, let me add my thanks to that of all of the folks who've been on this call uh, for your coming and for your very uh, forthcoming uh, discussion tonight. Um, what I was going to suggest was um, our community board has a weekly uh, blast that has several thousand um, people who uh, have asked to have it in their inboxes. And because of that, um, we have access to uh, providing uh, announcements for events and so on and so forth. If um, we could work with you to prepare some kind of informational blurb uh, around uh, reporting crime in the subway or uh, some uh, kind of uh, notice that would be helpful to you. It seems to me our district manager and his staff would um, very much be uh, happy to do that. So just to work with you on what it is that you want out there in a very crisp and short way that would be helpful to getting your message out. I think we'd love to help. Thank you. Yeah, definitely appreciate that 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 offer. And we we, we would uh, definitely, definitely, definitely uh, jump on that. Uh, Chief, so can I add one thing? So you know, everyone on this call, um, if you have a particular station that you see issues all the time, you know, station that you use all the time, uh, you know, you can Google that station, uh, NYPD. Each of these stations is covered by a neighborhood coordinating officer, whether it's District 1 or District 3. And if you go on the District 1 website, NYPD portal, or the uh, District 3 website, it'll give you that uh, uh, neighborhood coordinating sergeant's name, and it'll give you to each of the neighborhood coordinating sergeant's uh, uh, officer's uh, area of coverage. And uh, you can actually call that officer or send them an email, and they will get back to you. And, and, and address that issue. Now, that, this is not for a 911. This is like if you, you get on the train every morning, you see the same homeless guy sleeping, you know, you can get, you can call your neighborhood coordinating officer and they will get right on that. And that's somebody that you can speak to directly. They have an email and they have a phone number. And, they, and, and, and that geographical area or that station is their responsibility. So that's another avenue you can do. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Doug and then Polly. Uh, once again, thank you for being here. I, that was really interesting. I didn't realize that there were NCOs in transit. I, we are familiar with the NCOs in our local precincts, so maybe we'll do some follow-up to find out which NCOs are uh, here. Maybe they can we can get to know them on our transportation committee once in a while. I don't, how many NCOs are there it's within CB7? You don't have to answer that right now if you don't know offhand. Well, I got, I got the District 1 and the District 3 commanding officers on. Captain Sandu, are you on now? Yes, Inspector, I'm on. Uh, I have, okay, uh, can you answer that question and then Sal, yes. you'll follow up. Yes, sir. I have uh, one sergeant and seven uh, POs covering three zones, sir. One and seven, so to total of eight. They're all NCOs? They're all NCOs. Uh, they're covering three sectors. We have one admin and we have a sergeant, Nick Mo Mussolini. Great. Well, that's that's really helpful to know. Yeah, look, look and this is, with our NCOs. this is why these meetings are so important. We can get that on a loop. This is like missed opportunities, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at like, like wow, like, like, and you seem very in tune with what's going on, NYPD, with you're talking NCOs and, you know, for the public not to know, particularly the public that depends on the uh, subway uh, system, not to know that they have uh, NCOs is concerning to me. Yes. We got to get that out. We got to do better. I'm so uh, glad that you mentioned it. This is great to know. And we're going to follow up. And I think it's great that we know as a community board. And it will also be nice to know that, that we can relay that to the public, just like um, just like Beverly said. The only other thing I wanted to say in which uh, may, I, the obviously the uh, the police know this, but Every single car is numbered. Not a bad idea to take note of what car you're on. Maybe you snap a picture of it. So if you do lose something, you know what car you're on. And if you have to report something, you say exactly what car you're on. I think it's very helpful to for the NYPD respond accordingly. Um, you know, to say I'm on the second to last car, I think, I'm not sure. But if you have that car number, that car is identified just like Central Park, where every single light post 
is numbered. And when if you would, God forbid, to get into trouble in Central Park and you give the light post number, uh, the precinct knows exactly where you are in the park on the map. So just wanted to say that and then I'll be quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Paul, so how many NCOs you have in District 3? I have the same thing, sir. One NCO sergeant with seven NCO police officers. Two that are assigned to uh, DB7. They actually cover all the stations in the core precinct. Yeah, so this is good stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Polly, when you're ready. Yeah, I've been ready. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone uh, for, again, such a wonderful presentation and with lots of information. And I really appreciate you, Andrew, because you kind of reached out and made it happen. Um, I did take the liberty of going on to the website and um, looking at your safety rules. That's where I got the code of conduct. So I did see that you have a list of NCOs. So that is definitely good to know because uh, that's important that we can reach out to them directly. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just mention has, because uh, I know Andrew mentioned that they will kind of retrofit the new turnstiles. I wanted to know, anyone can answer this question because, you know, we're saying sometimes people have a weapon that are coming through. Is there a way to put a scanner in the system, whatever turnstiles coming up, so this way to kind of alert if somebody's handling or has a weapon on them or something so that you guys can get a signal Wi-Fi wise? Since we're going to have the people out of the booth and we're going to have officers present is, you know, is that something that uh, you guys have talked about between the NYPD and transit? And then my other question is, again, getting back to the lithium batteries, because that's been a major issue. I would like to know, has the NYPD department uh, discussed anything as far as putting a VIN number on these batteries? Uh, for people who say that they're using it as an independent contractor for work, et cetera, because I know that uh, VIN numbers are put on bikes in case they are stolen. Um, has there any, been any discussion regarding that? So I'll, I'll answer the question, and Steve, you're going to get the tough question on the battery. I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I'm going to answer the easy, and I don't know if he knows the answer. Um, okay. As far as a metal detector, we're not there yet. We're, we're not there. Okay. So there, there are discussions. Um, about uh, may maybe doing temporary or periodic here and there, like they do in the schools. But there, I'm not aware, and Steve, you could help me out, and maybe Andrew, you could help me out. I'm not aware of any metal detectors um, in the subway system, you know, permanently fixed in the subway system. No, I, mean, I don't I'm, believe there are. No, we, we no, don't have any technology any like that yet. Yeah, the discussion. Oh, okay. there, 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 there is, there is a uh, discussion. I, I go, I'll go okay. even further. There are, there are other means um, to detect weapons and explosives, also, which I won't go into. Okay. That, mm -hmm. you know, we we have a, uh, you know, we're talking about crime, right? And we, you know, it, it certainly is a crime, but we didn't even touch the topic of terrorism, counterterrorism. And right. we have a our own counterterrorism unit assigned to the Transit Bureau. And obviously the NYPD's counterterrorism uh, unit is uh, closely um, aligned with, uh, with the subway system. So it's probably a topic I don't want to talk about publicly right now. Um, oh, no, I get it. I just wanted yeah. to know if there was a discussion because I was thinking about that person that came into the train with the gun and the smoke, you know, and started shooting and everybody had to run out, you know, so that was pretty scary. Uh, so that's what I was thinking about. How did he get into the system, you know, with that weapon and, you know, was able to do that. So I just wanted to know if there's discussion. I know that's sensitive information, so I understand that, but it's good to know that there's a discussion. And now what about the um, VIN numbers for the lithium batteries? Has there been any, any discussion about that? Steve, do you know, I, I I don't, I'm just, to be honest with you, Steve, do you know anything about the topic? Are you are you um, referring back to the lithium battery bikes? Is yes. That what you're talking about? Yes. So, so we, don't, we don't do that in the Transit Bureau, but I know that they uh -huh. have a VIN 
I know they have a VIN etching program in the precincts for people that right. want to get their bikes VIN etched for them getting stolen or anything like that. But we don't have anything right. like that in the Transit Bureau. Okay. Thank you. So with that, again, um, I don't know if there's any other questions or anyone has their hands up or looking in the attendees. Uh, I know that Steve Board is here also from the mayor's uh, office, the liaison. So I don't know if he wants to make any comments or feedback if he's still here. I'm trying to look and see. Oh, I uh, think he I might think you're already left. left. Yes. Him okay. and Estelle, All remember. right. Then. Put him to sleep. Right. Put him to sleep. Hey, I, I, just I don't know. No, you didn't put him to sleep. <laughs> One topic, very, very important. Very, it, it's uh -huh. very important. We, you know, Monday night we had a tragedy in Brooklyn. Um, I'm going to talk about subway surfing very quick. And oh, yeah. this is a, a phenomena that is really, really affecting us in New York City. Largely fueled by social media and largely fueled by kids wanting to videotape themselves and post it on whatever social media platform, for cred, for likes, for attention. Here's the problem with that. They're being seriously hurt and like life altering injuries and they're dying. Just Monday night, we had a 15 year old boy uh, subway surfing. For those of you who don't know what subway surfing is, they climb on top of the uh, train and they either stand up or they lay down and they ride the train. Um, this 15 year old Monday night uh, went up on top of the train. As he's on top of the train, he hit a fixed uh, object, um, mm. knocked him off the train and caused his death. He's 15 years old. Um, I, I said a yesterday, and as I sit here as a father of two children, I can't imagine, God forbid, um, I can't imagine the pain and suffering and the heartbreak that's going on in that family right now. This is avoidable. So I, I looked at um, incidents. I, I counted five real nasty incidents that occurred um, within the last 12 months. A lot of commonalities with this. It's the ages. Um, out of those five, when I say nasty incidents, I'm talking about two deaths and three horrific life-altering uh, injuries. I'm talking about amputations, the whole nine yards. Um, 12 years old to 16 years old. Uh, that's how old all five incidents the ages were. 12 years old to, to 16 years old. If we could get this out, I don't know if anyone, uh, your children, uh, your family, if anyone's a, a, a teacher, uh, we're around young, impressionable kids. If we could get this topic out and just explain to them that uh, it's extremely dangerous. Forget about being illegal. A, it is illegal to do that. Um, but there's no do-overs, uh, if you will, if, if something goes wrong. It's over. And these kids are young, they're immature, and they're really not thinking of these consequences at the time they're doing this. They're thinking about the likes and the attention they're going to get. So this is a subject matter that needs to be discussed New York City wide. I'd appreciate that. And if we could keep that boy's family uh, in our thoughts and prayers uh, tonight, that would uh, that would be pretty awesome. And that's all I got to say about that. Yeah, well, that is horrible. And we, we have a member on a committee, Courtney, you know, who's on the YEL Youth and uh, Education Libraries Committee. And I myself am an educator. So uh, we definitely will uh, put together something so that this way we can, you know, invite the public and invite you back, you know, to really talk about the uh, seriousness of what's going on. Uh, I would like to, how are they getting on the train? Like they just jump so, on top when it's okay, not moving? Uh, like I'll, that. I'll give you the, uh, the usual way they do it. Um, they go onto the train, they open the doors in between the two cars and in between the two cars, they step up and they climb on top. That's the usual way they're getting on. There's a lot of commonalities. There's, there's you know, real scenic locations on the New York City uh, subway system, whether it's going up. This, this kid was going over to Williamsburg Bridge. Um, so th that, that, uh, that line going over the, the J line, right? 
the J line going over to Williamsburg Bridge. J and M. Um, I'm, we're going to go, Andrew, we're going to just look at the J. We want to talk about commonalities, right? Three of the five incidents occurred on that J at the Williamsburg Bridge. So for whatever reason, that seems to be, whether it's the background of the city or, or the bridge, and then another location that seems to be very, very popular with subway surfing is through Queens uh, on that seven line, particularly in and around City Field. Um, so this is a topic that we really, really got to get on top of it and, and stop before something, another tragedy occurs. And I'm sorry I'm rambling. I just, you talk no, about the uh, consequences and, and um, the family, certainly, first and foremost, right? But what, what about the people on the train that witnessed this, that have to live with this? What about the cops that got to carry the kid's body off the train tracks? Right. What about the conductor that hit the, hit the kid has to live with this? There's so many more people that are affected, you know, deeply affected by incidents like this. Again, first and foremost, that kid and the kid's family. Uh, but this really affects so much more. And again, I said it before, I'll end it with this. This is avoidable. This is preventable. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Kep Kepper, uh, Stephen Hill, Captain Salator, Marches. Um, you have all been a wealth of knowledge. The community cannot thank you enough for all the hard work that you do, you, you do and will continue to do. And we're glad to hear that you are open to coming back. Uh, Whenever. So Whenever. I just I want to thank my team and um, to the greatest cops in the world, the New York oh, City yes. cops, the men and women, amazing, amazing human beings. Um, I, I can't thank them enough. They do God's work. They do tremendous work day in and day out. We're not perfect. We are not perfect, uh, but they try their best. They're put into super complex, non-scripted scenarios every day, uh, and they do it because they believe in it. So I just want to thank them and recognize them. Thank you we so thank much. We thank them as well. Totally, totally. We thank you. Thank you, Jean. You know, you put your life on thank the line. You. Yeah. So with that, everyone, we're going to go to our last, last item on the agenda, uh, where we had a discussion uh, last month um, about the, again, lithium batteries. And, you know, uh, I had also located a guide from the fire department as well uh regards to what landlords are required to do i don't know if you have that uh with you william that you could just show them for a minute yeah i can share my screen okay we can bring it up on the screen because i was thinking about you know the big discussion right now you know people are afraid and there was recent fires uh about the lithium batteries and a uh, complex uh, unfortunately, it was on the Lower East Side. And so I just wanted to kind of show everyone that, you know, this is something very important. They might want to talk to their landlord or whoever and let them know that, you know, uh, if there is something stored in the building, et cetera, that's something that they need to really pay attention to and maybe give this information out to some uh, landlord or someone where you live, to your neighbors. But there's a lot of information online about it, and it's very serious, very scary. Uh, William, you can click on the next page where it says two, three, and four. Yeah, just briefly. So there's a lot of information on how FDNY is handling this. And unfortunately, you know, it's very serious. They're showing you different types of vehicles. Uh, go to page three. And these are pictures of the devastation. And what they're saying is, you know, there really is nothing to respond to. Like some people might want to use a fire extinguisher. That doesn't work, you know. So people really have to be careful. And that's something that I think we should follow up on just to have a discussion at some future date uh, with the public at large. And maybe, uh, Max, we could get this online at our website so people can read it, you know, so this way they're more aware. Because I don't know about you guys, but for me, I'm concerned at night if when I'm sleeping and if I know people have bikes, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, if something happens, I won't know and I won't get out. So 
for me, I think this is a very serious issue uh, with the proliferation of the batteries. So yeah, I just it, wanted to bring that to your attention. Yeah, I just wanted to piggy up, piggyback off of your point as well. You know, mm -hmm. some some members may have a battery, may have a a, a, a e-bike or e-scooter, or not, but maybe your neighbor does. So making sure that everyone is educated on proper use of the batteries, such as not charging it in front of the door or using, not using aftermarket chargers, charging batteries. Uh, th those things, uh, chargers, those things will ruin the battery, overload it, and a fire can happen like that. Um, so just to kind of piggyback off of your point, this is a huge area of concern because it can happen out of nowhere without warning. And that's the scary part about lithium batteries. And it's, and lithium batteries have always been dangerous to begin with, but it seems to be that the batteries and the safety protocols that are safety protocols that exist in computers, I don't think exist right now for e-bikes and e-scooters for some reason. So I think we need to do more research on that, figure out what resolution we can help create so we can influence our, our legislative body to take some actions on what should be done because we live in apartment. Most of us live in apartment buildings. Um, and people who live in houses can keep this in the garage and it could be a little bit safer. Um, yes, Linda, I see your hand up. Yeah, they're, they're actually, I'm not muted, but okay, there actually is a, a storage unit, the first in New York State, in White Plains at Avalon Bay for lithium batteries. And they did this, the Avalon Bay community did this, and we were hoping that they would, um, it was created by large buildings, and we were hoping that they would that it would extend to New York apartments as well. So it's been it's a tried and true storage unit for lithium batteries, so that people who have them don't have them in their apartments at night. Oh, that's good. that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. But we, then White Plains, uh, the White Plains it went through an entire was a, the entire municipality went through this their city council, et cetera. It was a big deal, and we thought it would extend to New York City, oh. but it did not. Yeah. Courtney, please. Boy, about to open this can of worms. Probably just something we should be talking about um, in connection also with the discussion that, was, that we had the other night on the joint parks and transportation. But honestly, these things aren't registered. And part of the problem with us not knowing how many may be in your building or what the storage is on those is the fact that we don't have any regulations that I believe that allow us to have a sense of how many they are, where they are uh, at any given time. And so my argument on this would be, I think Linda's point is a really good one. They also really think it is probably time to have that conversation in connection with everything else happening in e-bikes in our neighborhood. And I think this would be a good committee to take that on because it is in my mind, a public safety issue. It is a public safety issue. Absolutely. Thank you. I totally agree with you, Corby. Uh, the other day, I believe Jay said three years ago that um, he and I guess other members kind of uh, worked on this issue. And I don't know that dropped on the state level, so we need to follow up. And I can't do that. So I don't know if they wrote a resolution back then, but they said it was three years ago. But I want to speak to them. And I do feel that this is very important and we should. Uh, talk to our legislators and see what we can get done and our elected officials because um, it's very important. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, any other comments regarding this issue? Uh, I see Doug has his hand up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, obviously, there have been quite a number of fatalities even this year and last year with regard to the lithium ion batteries. Um, and I have heard about some of the technology that Linda just mentioned at Avalon Bay. Of course, these are massive landlords that have the ability when they're building a new building. The question is, how do you retrofit uh, a smaller building or a building that is not, um, you know, is, is not a, a, an affluent landlord or tenant? So you have people that are working hard for their income with these uh, um, bikes. And I think, you know, some of the warnings I've heard is that many of these are not UA listed. So I know that there's been some discussion at city council about this. There's, there was in fact a, okay. um, I, uh, a, a, a call for the federal government to intervene. In fact, I, I'm trying, maybe someone on this call knows there was a, a, a decree, I think from the NY, from the, from the fire department of New York 
to the federal government that this is basically an emergency situation and that they need to intervene um, with some kind of legislation and safety uh, for these batteries. You know, one of the things is that they get bounced around a lot and they 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 break. I don't know, and I sure hope not. I don't know if there's been any spontaneous combustion of any of these batteries when they're not being charged. So, for example, we were talking about these batteries and devices in the in the subway system, which, of course, is a whole different problem with crowding. But, you know, I don't know if it seems to me that these batteries have um, exploded while they're being charged and they might have been the wrong batteries being charged by the wrong charger or it's a refurbished battery. Uh, that is very cheap in quality. So I, I know that our elected officials are on top of it. It would be good to know if there's any pen, pending legislation that we can review and possibly support. Well, to, uh, I just want to share the screen of that document one more time because you bring up a really interesting point. On the third page, it reads, damage or unstable batteries or improper charging can cause the batteries to overheat, leading to an explosive, aggressive fire. So it's the fire's are not exclusive to just being charged. If the battery is indeed damaged somehow, there is always a chance of that exploding. Um, so I just wanted to show this um, really important part here that y even if you're unplugged um, and the battery is damaged, there's always an opportunity for that battery to overheat and, and blow up. Um, so it is a big area of concern. I think Courtney's point of following through on, on on trying to get these this, these things registered, know where they are, I think is really important. And um, I think we should follow through on that. And I agree. I do agree with that. That's a number one issue that we need to uh, address. I think this is, this is just, me, me, um, just committee discussion. I think we're going to get pushback on that because, um, because of different bicyclists bicycle lobbies, the bike lobbies that don't want registrations for any kind of bike, you're going to have a problem with that. So, but it well, is something we should be taking up. Yeah, well, we'll figure it out. We'll cross that road when we get there, I think. But I think taking some action, or at least some form of action of figuring out how to keep people safe, because it's about safety um, first, um, I think is really important. I, I agree with you that it would be a, a tough hurdle. I, I don't deny that. But I think safety wins in all, at all costs. We're on our, we're on record from the transportation committee as asking the state to license these e-bikes. Yeah, and and insure. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And insure, yes. Yeah. We've also, mm -hmm. we've also got the city bikes that are, that are, are uh, that are using lithium batteries now too. Are yeah, city bikes. Those? Are they going? Are there going to be licenses on each <clears throat> one? Is there a way to register each each, each in, of the individual bikes? Every city, every city bike has a number, like a serial number, whether they are a regular bike or an e-bike or even the new silver white e-bikes. They all have a number, so you know what's happening to each bike. As far as them being registered to the city, I I, I don't know. I think that's something They're we not. could try to figure out if we can ever get in contact with someone with Lyft city bike. Uh, but I know that's been a, quite challenging for the transportation committee. Um, yeah, we've tried. Yeah. I would say. Yeah, well, yeah. well, now, wait a minute. Can we go back for one second? So, uh, sorry. City bike agreed. A totally different thing. But at least those aren't living in people's apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. so I think I would hope. Um, Andrew, am I am I hearing you correctly that we have a past resolution on this that I'm not recalling? We have a resolution asking the state to license e-bikes and and require insurance on them. Right and, now, and it passed full board. They are facing down streets, sometimes the wrong we direction, and they could hit okay. you, and you have no idea who it was. So here's the question. Yeah, no, okay, sorry. No, go ahead, Lynn. No, e-bikes aren't confined only to the delivery workers anymore. They're they're they use they are mode of transportation for a lot of folks. You know, I see business associates of mine with you know their e-bikes. They think that you know, and they're lithium batteries. I mean, it is and same thing with the scooters. This is the new form of transportation. Agreed. Agreed. Oh, I, I'm only sorry. 
Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's almost bedtime over here. Um, so so I guess what all I'm slowly uh my brain is yeah, my brain getting here. My brain stopped it. Right. Um a lot of facts uh, right. Right, so. Does it does it mean if we've got the past resolution, then couldn't we write a letter with a with an overlay of hey we passed this resolution this is a safety issue there have been explosions we really need this so that people can know where they are I mean if we've already passed it can't we write a letter on it yes. Mm -hmm. I would hope that our resolution, I asked after we passed it, that the resolution be sent to our state senators and our assembly persons uh, representing this district. And I, I, I'm assuming that it did go out when, right, when but, we passed it. Right, but three years ago, we didn't have the public safety overlay on it. That's true. That we didn't have just been, refurbished it, and, and charging it correctly. Because it had just been passed. Yeah. Because yeah, the lithium batteries weren't blowing up in people's homes right. everywhere. You know, and, and, and they were relegated to... Lithium ion batteries. Does, you know, yeah. so that was I think it. it was three years ago. I think it was much uh, less time than it that. Was. Also, there was a different, there was another, uh, we should pull up that resolution because there was something else on it besides registration and insurance. Um, it may have been uh, limiting motorized vehicles other than um, bicycles and pedal assist, keeping, I think it was something about. Um, yeah the bikes not being in the bike lanes it was it was bike lanes or the park or something and this is now ringing they're already out. not allowed and they have something in it as well about the speed and limiting the speed to no more than so many miles per hour right it doesn't help if you've got a 200 pound e-bike and you get hit by it so it doesn't really matter but they're used by commuters now and it's well, not all right so and a i'm gonna interject at this point because we're kind of like talking over each other and so uh what we'll do is look at that resolution andrew because a lot of us uh have not been privy to it and then we'll, we'll get bring it from it max and uh and we'll distribute it thank you andrew we appreciate that uh the next item on the agenda that i want to talk about is there's an upcoming meeting regarding public bathrooms uh cb4 and cb5 have passed the resolution uh, but the meeting is March 2nd uh, with Ju Julia Chow. So I know, Madge, I believe you had been notified and William, myself. So if anyone else on the committee or the board would like to attend the meeting, I can send you the information uh, so that this way, you know, we can kind of decide for our board, because I know we had a discussion about locating and identifying space for two bathrooms in our district. Uh, I know Madge had already looked at a couple of places, but, you know, I just want us again to really look at this and to kind of figure out what would work for us, because I believe Shelly Fine's location at West 108th Street, Wishfish, uh, I believe he had mentioned that they have a public bathroom there. So we really have to kind of map out where it would best suit uh, our district's purposes. So I think that's something, you know, that we need to look at. So if anyone is interested, as I said, in attending the meeting, you know, I'll definitely send you the email so you can attend. Thank you. Yes, Linda. Doug and Linda. Um, Doug. Linda, you go first. Sorry. I, I was wondering the public bathrooms, the, uh, during Bloomberg uh, admi administration, they, they had purchased, I think, 175 Samusa public bathrooms that city council turned down when they started to uh, locate them and they started to, to um, install them. So I'm, I'm wondering, are they about to use, are they going to repurpose them for them since they already exist? Is that what the discussion is about? Or is I have, uh, as far as I know, when I attended the last meeting, um, there was no discussion about repurposing those particular bathroom models. Uh, it was more a discussion about the zoning and also um, signage, and uh, that was the limit. That's why I want to attend the meeting, so this way I can understand what direction uh, they're going in and then what we should do, because this is our district and we have to do something that's exclusive to our needs. 
So I will find out, you know, when I attend a meeting, Linda. Would you like to attend a meeting as well, Linda? What is it again? It'll be uh, March 2nd. So that's and next it'll be, at, yeah. Next Thursday. Be, what time, please? Yeah. Uh, it'll be at 6.30. PM? Online, online, yes. Yeah, I could, I could do that. That would, that would okay. make sense. Again, I'll send you the information. Difficult uh, to do it, obviously, with all of okay. us. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. It might be 5 o'clock. I can't hear you, Madge. It might be 5 o'clock. Well, let me check because I have it right here. So well, if you could send me the link, that would be great. Then I can register. I'll send you the link. Thank you uh -huh. very much. Doug, go for it. I, 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 sorry, I didn't see it on the agenda, but doesn't it's fine, whether it's new business, old business, but it, I guess the question is... They put it on the... Uh, okay, I mean, it's fine. Well, who, but who is conducting this meeting? And I, in other words, is it coming from the city, from the, the new person from the, the that's been appointed for the public domain? I think no, this is spearheaded by CB5. CB4 oh, this is and CB5, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we were... I guess the idea was that we also, I don't think we've identified all of the public restrooms we actually have in our district. I know that we probably have more than we know, but we probably don't have enough. I mean, there's a dearth, but there, we have exactly. pops, right? The public, the privately owned public spaces, uh -huh. they are required to have a bathroom. So it'd be good to know how many pops we have and how many we have and then how many more we need and then where should they go, right? Is That's sort of the point of the- Exactly. Kind of. Yes. Right. That's the next step for us. Yep. So I think we covered old business. And does anyone have anything for new business? Cool. I do. Let's go. Go for it, Doug. Well, something that I, I, William and I spoke about, and I, and I asked to be related to Polly. So we, uh, we are, and I did have a confirmation that Chief Obey. Um, is willing to come to our meeting. Chief Obey is, uh, she's an incredible person. I have met her. Um, she is the commanding officer of Manhattan North. So basically every precinct from around 59th to the tip of Manhattan is under her command. She is the highest ranking African uh, in the NYPD, not African-American, African. She's from Africa. She is a wonderful person, a great public speaker. She's a, you know, She's she's gentle and powerful at the same time. So she uh, her lieutenant uh, confirmed that uh, she is able and willing to come to our meeting. Now I know that we may have some changing around. So our is the next public safety committee meeting on the twenty second of March, or is that changed? Because I, um, Max, it's, it's do you happen 29th. to have that calendar up <laughs> by chance? Twenty ninth. Yeah, give me yeah. a sec. The twenty ninth. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'll Build simply write an email and I'll put you guys on copy so we can okay. make sure that she's also okay for the 29th. And Wait, perhaps, sorry, you said the 29th. Oh yeah, 29th, 630. Okay, because I, I know like we say the public safety task force meets the fourth month. It's actually, I think there's five Wednesdays in March. If I, <laughs> when looking at the calendar. March. Yeah, so that actually <laughs> is the fifth one, which is why it was a little confusing. Yeah, that's why I, I said, oh, I counted four. I'm like 22nd. And I'm like, okay, well, that's right. So, all right, so I'll, we'll, we'll see. I'll see if she's also available for the 29th. I hope so. And then, you know, I think we, we can, you know, Exciting. prepare for the meeting and promote the meeting. And um, I think it's another great opportunity to have, uh, you know, an incredible person joining if, us. This was exciting. I'll quickly Oh, uh, I was just going to quick say from a, a, a planning perspective, um, if you, I don't know if you guys intentionally just picked the last one thinking it was the fourth when it's the fifth or if that's specific, but if you do need to switch it to accommodate the speaker, actually the 22nd is still open. You could think about it. Just let me know tomorrow or just, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, whatever, coach whatever coach. will work for her, Doug. Um, I'm willing to just move the schedule around. I think it'd be wonderful to have her on. Great. I mean, I'll, I can add, just ask if the 29th would also work. And, and if so, then I guess we just keep it. And if not, then we can yeah. adjust. Okay. That sounds like a plan. Then just what Doug, if you could loop me or Jesse in once that's squared away. Sure. Cool. Yeah. And we'll, we'll ask if there's anything that we want to yeah. feature or ask her or that she wants to talk about any, you know, that'd be great. She's got an incredible story, by the way. I, it sounds it's sounds <laughs> wonderful, Doug. It, it's very exciting. What we probably should do, guys, is, is have like a, a whole list of questions in advance. 
So, you know, so that we're prepared and she can be prepared. Yeah, we can promote it. It would be nice to, you know, meet your commanding chief of Manhattan North. Um, like I said, her she was she did a great interview on New York One. You can look up, and uh, she uh, started as a cadet, and now she is. Uh, you will look it up. High places and very very impressive person. Wonderful. If anyone else does not have any new business, then I motion to end the meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Wonderful. Everyone, thank you so much and have a wonderful evening and enjoy your dinner and enjoy your TV shows and everything. <laughs> this was such an exciting time. <laughs> thank you, everyone. It was great. Chief Kemper was amazing. Anyway, it really was. Good night. <laughs>